So we're going to talk about continuous updates and uh, some failure stories, ever, everything that you like in the way that you like, you know, horror stories and what's not. And, and we will start with a simple question, why we want to update software? Why we want it as, as, um, as a software renders, as, something, as someone who writes software? What's wrong with write the software once and just uh, sell it for the um, rest of our lives? just making free money, right? Um, I mean, that's what I would do. And I know a couple of software applications or that actually do that, right? I think I have something that no one touched in, in 20 years. And that's, that's a good business model. Unfortunately, not for all of us. Just because we have users and users want features and they want those features now. So obviously the, the, most, the most obvious reason that drive us to release new versions and to update our software is the market uh, pressure that we have from our competitors and from our users that want more features and, and faster. Um, I guess um, the reason why we upgrade our phones, our smartphones every couple of years because they have new features, why we upgrade all software because it has new features. And, and that's, you know, you remember that? When you had to go to a repair shop for, for update? I don't think a lot of people actually did that. Instead, there was a new model of Nokia with a snake, and we're like, okay, let's buy a new phone, right? And, and then um, maybe some geek of us, who remembers a data cable? Anyone? Yeah, just a couple of hands, yeah. And it actually was different from your charging cable, and you had to go to the store and actually buy a data cable, and then what you can do, like, export your contacts. But still, if you want an upgraded version of Snake, you had to buy a new phone. And, uh, but, but then things actually change, right? Then we had got smartphones with a proper operating system, proper software, proper apps, and we were updating them. Now they kind of update by themselves. And, and I think that the idea of it uh, is, for, um, um, is for us to get features faster, right? And, but there is another reason. Um, I'm sorry for this update time. It's my something went bad in terms of um, my animation, but the idea is this is a timeline, and in this timeline everything is fine. And I want to talk about how things get wrong in terms of security vulnerabilities. So in some point of time, we have vulnerability discovered. And this is a fundamental vulnerability. It might be in our software, it might be in our hardware, it might be in our CPU chips, or, or whatever. Now, when vulnerability is discovered, our software is in danger. It's not necessarily under attack, but there is a vulnerability that people can exploit. And then, actually, someone come up with, comes up with an exploit of our vulnerability, and in point of, at some point of time, this exploit become known, and here we have, depending on uh, who found this exploit, good guys or bad guys, we might have you know, different scenarios. Let's say that the good guys, the white hats, find this exploit, and everybody know about it now. And then, actually, someone tries an attack using this exploit. Eventually, we release a new version of software in which this exploit is fixed. So this tiny red dot, or, or red line, is the period of time in which under our software is under attack. And this is how long it took us to actually create an update that will patch this vulnerability. So you can see here that we started to work when the ex uh, exploit was reported, and we actually out of danger, at least for this exploit, once we patched, once we have a software update. And this is not bad, that's like a tiny, tiny piece of time. Now let's take another example. When we have exploit B, but this one found by the bad guys, by the black hats, by someone who wants to hack us. Now, actually it's used to attack us, and we discover that we are under attack sometimes later. 
After we discover that, we actually patch our software, we start working on the pipe. Now, this is obviously a worse situation because the time that we are under attack, what's going on? Uh, I think maybe the battery deal or something. Yeah, but okay. The time that we are under attack is, is larger. And it's larger because we discovered that we are under attack just by the fact that, you know, bad things happen. No one warned us. And obviously here, the update time is super, super critical as well. So basically, you can see how the faster, fast, faster updates actually make you more secure. And today, as a, every company is a software company, security vulnerabilities are the new oil spills, right? That's the biggest threat we have on our economy, on, on, basically, on basically everything. So this is a big deal. Now, how about a vulnerability that cannot be uh, patched? Vulnerability which is always with us, and it's just a amount of time, it's just a matter of time until new exploits are come up with and then attack us. And here with exploit C, you see an example where it's actually um, as it was discovered, as it was invented, it was directly used to attack us immediately. And the, 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 this danger zone, this vulnerability period, starts, kicks, kicks in immediately. And, and then we discover that we have a breach much later, and then we need to start working on update, and only that we, we, we are actually going to patch it. So here, limiting the update time or improving the update time, moving this closer actually reduces our window of attack by whatever we can do, right? So there is nothing we can do with this part, but we need to struggle to make this as short as possible. Does it make sense? So as I mentioned, imagine if we had a vulnerability that cannot be patched. And now we have it. And we have it for a while now. Generally last, um, last year, anyone remember Meltdown Inspector? There was a big fuss about b uh, bugs in, uh, with um, memory that can be accessed uh, from different areas that should be protected, but, but they are not. In all the CPUs and all the architectures, um, including uh, Intel, AMD, ARM, and everything. And we kind of start to forget about, forget about it because the one that wasn't in use a lot, that was Meltdown, was actually patched. But the second one, Spectre, is actually proven now, February 25th, some threats impossible to defeat. This vulnerability cannot be patched by itself because it uses the knowledge of how software is written to guess what's in memory, what is the footprint in memory. And the thing is, we write software in exactly the same way, all of us. We use best practices, we use patterns, we actually try to mimic other people's software and that makes this exploit more dangerous and, uh, sorry, this vulnerability more dangerous and exploits are easier to come up with. So that makes our story of continuous updates not only, well, it will be nice if the vendors would give me features faster, it actually makes it critical to the success of our organization. And you know, the good news are we know how to do it. And this is a very important document. This is um, a, a yearly report by uh, um, DevOps Research and Assessment Institute, um, which is called the State of DevOps. Um, this institute was acquired by, by Google. So it's now a part of Google Cloud, but the new report is, is due very, very soon. I think maybe we're weeks away. Uh, meanwhile, I will show you the results of the previous one. Uh, so it is a serious report. They, they surveyed uh, 30,000 people, and they divided the results into three main groups. The low performance, the medium performance, and the high performance, when in the high performance, there is an elite group, and if you wish, you can think about them as your Googlers, your Netflixes, your, you know, the, the really looking forward uh, organizations that adopt DevOps very, very successfully. 
And you can see that on this elite group actually managed to deploy on demand multiple times a day. And that means that when they discover that they are in the risk of an exploit, it's a matter of write the code that fixes it and we will deploy it immediately. So, uh, you know, we, we know how to do this stuff. So, my name is Baruch, I'm a Chief Figure Officer at JFrog. Um, uh, and yes, we have booth, uh, oh, it's not downstairs, it's across this wall, and we have stickers that you really should go and, and, and get. We also have amazing t-shirts that are saying updates are coming, and yes, those are the continuous updates that we are speaking uh, here. So go grab a t-shirt, go grab a sticker, and talk to us about continuous update. Um, as you realize by now, I'm a very entertaining guy, and that means that you should follow me on Twitter. I'm at Baruch on Twitter. Um, if you're still not convinced, my Twitter handle is on each and every slide, which makes it very easy for you. I, I try to make things easier here. Um, very important disclaimer. Um, this is what's called Culture Map from a great book called Culture Map by Irene Mayer. And uh, you can see that the most emotionally expressive and confrontal people are from Russia and Israel. I am from both. Um, it conflicts with um, the passive-aggressive culture of California and Silicon Valley. Uh, so if I offend people, I'm not really sorry. I just offended all of you, called you passive-aggressive, right? It went great, I think. I will keep doing that. So uh, in any way, I apologize in advance or, or, or not. Um, that's the most important slide of this, of this talk. Um, I prepared a special page for you. It's called uh, under jeffrey.com show notes. You go there, you find all the slides that are there. The video, if Bill didn't screw it up. Um, all the links, including culture map and the vulnerability story, what is window of vulnerability and why Spectre is incurable. All this stuff is there. Um, comments, so you can express your gratitude for me giving this talk. Rating, so you can express your gratitude for me giving this talk. And raffle, that I can express my gratitude for you being here. So go there and, and sign up. It's in the Amazon Echo Dot. Good stuff. So this is the most important slide. Um, the, the link to show notes is also in, on, the, on the bottom of every slide. When you praise on Twitter, don't forget the DevOps world hashtag and the liquid software hashtag that we are going to talk later. Okay, so you wanted to update faster. I convinced you that you really should. So let's see how it actually works. Here is a great example. This is a, a blog by Mark Reynolds who is the head of everything Java related, I don't remember his title, platform, architect, something. He decides everything in Java. And um, what it is, June, uh, June 2017. Uh, sorry, that's, or September, I don't know what, times, what time format. Anyway, long time ago, two years ago, um, he published um, an announcement that Java is going to be released every six months instead of every year and a half or maybe three years or maybe whenever. But now, since then, every six months, cool stuff. Moving forward, making faster updates. Um, we are now, um, what, um, two years into this process and we have new four new versions out every half a year from this blog. So that was written when Java 8 was, um, um, was uh, the, the, the latest production version. And after that, we have Java 9, Java 10, Java 11, and Java 12. Um, something didn't work. Two years after, 83% of the people who answered a very respectable the state of developer ecosystem with oh, almost 7,000 developers uh, that answered it, 83% are still on Java 8. And I mean, why? Obviously, Java 9, 11, 12 are better in any possible way. They have more features that the users want, and they're also more secure. So what happened? Why people didn't update? To understand that, we need to understand why people update at all. And for that, let's take a look at the decision diagram. I have no idea why it's from right to left. Maybe it's some Israeli thing, but 
It's too complicated to redo. So anyway, update available. Yay, new Java, new features, great. Do we want it? Let's look inside and see if there are and if there is enough food on the table for us to want to grab it. If there is no, well, we won't update at all. If there are goodies that we want, now the next question is, is it a higher risk of an update? Okay, so um, now when we were battling with, uh, with the AV, my Mac asked me, do you want to restart to update? And I'm like, uh, there is some risk, I'm on a stage, it will probably won't work, so no. So if there are high risks, we might not want it. If there is no risk, yes, let's update. Now, if there is a high risk, do we trust the update? I answered no when my Mac suggested me to update because I have bad experience with Mac OS in the last years. Every time I try to update, something goes wrong. So no, I don't trust it. But if I would, if it was like five years ago, and I would update my Mac blindly, because yes, I trust it. I can do it three minutes before I go on stage, and I'm absolutely sure I go on stage and it works. Unfortunately, that's not, that's not our life anymore. But if I don't trust it, next question is why? Why I don't trust it? I mean, obviously, people invested a lot in quality assurance, right? They assure us that they tested everything. <laughs> um, but, but, but no, but I mean, really, software testing, we know how to do. The majority of us have good tests, unit tests, integration tests, smoke tests, acceptance tests, not acceptances, but you know, whatever, whatever tests. We know how to do tests. So what the problem is? The problem is complexity. And we are witnesses of this complexity, for example, in JFrog, by observing the number, the growing number of artifacts in the software developer ecosystem. And it started a long time ago, 2000, with Agile, when we start releasing uh, more frequently, and then continuous integration, when uh, Hudson started to build more and more artifacts for us, and then continuous delivery, when we actually start rolling out to production and saving the artifacts, and then infrastructure as code. Now suddenly we declare servers as artifacts, and then microservices, the more, you know, the smaller artifacts, the better, now we have them a lot. And then Docker, obviously, every change in Docker file generate artifacts and then serverless okay now our artifact are three lines of JavaScript code well that's on P NPM as well um, and then IOT obviously here that you know there, there is there is basically no limit so this is one symptom of complexity that makes it very hard to trust our software and other people's software but also data now Zettabytes are a thousand exabytes, which is a thousand petabytes, which is a lot. <laughs> and, and, and that means if we have so much data, it's hard to test. And you know what, hell, it's impossible to test. I mean, more and more companies give up the idea that staging environment can, should mimic our production environment. Just because it's impossible. Some still try, and here I go into one of many personal stories. So my wife, um, Alice, she started to get, so she has an account on the Ali Express or whatever, and she ordered something from there. And then, out of the blue, she started to get small envelopes from Ali, AliExpress every day, she didn't order anything. Some of them were completely empty, others had one white sock, new, <laughs> a tiny red tape, piece of red tape, black cloth for, for cleaning glasses, hairband, nice, <laughs> and a plastic ring. And we were truly puzzled, I mean, it's, it's almost cryptic, it's like, what's going on? And then we told this story to, to everybody just because it's fascinating, and one of my friends, 
his experience, whether on VP of engineering all over, he's like, yeah, they dump their production data on their staging server. And now you're, you know, they, st they, they, they actually test their provisioning, they test their fulfillment, they test their shipping, and uh, your wife address in their testing, uh, testing database. So yeah, I mean, forget about this vision that you have a staging test the environment good enough so you can trust the software or other people can trust the software. Right, so this is, this is how we update. And uh, um, so can we, back to the question, can we verify the, can we verify, if we don't trust the update, this is where we finished up, can we verify this update? If the answer is no, it's impossible to verify, then we just won't update. But if we think we can verify, then we will do the verification, accept and tests, client-side tests, before actually going to production. This is what happens with Java, right? When you are about to update tons of your production servers, you will invest time to verify the next version. Now the problem is you need six months to upgrade to a new version, and by then you will have a new version of Java. So no, I, I will skip number of versions just because the cost of verification is high enough. So you remember, so from one side we have the trust, on the other side, do we have enough food on the table? Do we have enough features that we really want it? Right, so, and, and, and this is our trade-off. Features that we really want and acceptance test cost. And, and this trade-off is real, and, and the question is, can we cheat the system? Can we do something that will break this vicious cycle of that's too expensive to update? And, and some companies do. So how about that? Update available, do we want it? Well, no one asks us. <laughs> and then this will work only for software which doesn't have high risks. So for example, anyone knows the version of Chrome they're running? Not really. Anyone knows when they go to the twitter.com, the version of Twitter that you're using? That's a not fair question because it's SaaS. Um, how about Twitter update up on your phone? Anyone knows the version? No, because all those are low risk, so they force an update on us. How about the operating system of your smartphone? Here everybody know, because the risks are high and suddenly this cheating won't work. So, for the rest of the talk, let's talk about what can possibly go wrong when people push updates and let's see how can we make it better. So I told you it will be a lot of personal stories. Here is another one. A couple of years ago I bought a great Wi-Fi system that is called back then Google on Hub, now it's called Google Wi-Fi. Uh, it's, it's a mesh of really awesome Wi-Fi routers. One of the things that they do, they auto-update, which sounds like a great idea. I will get new features, and I actually do get new features here and then. And uh, everything worked well until a um, couple of years ago, I was on, I think it was February 2017, I was on a business trip, and my wife calls me and she's like, you know what, kids are sitting in, I came home from work and kidding, kids are sitting in the dark. And I'm like, what, do we have like an, uh, an electricity outage? And she's like, no, the internet is down. And they shout Alexa, lights on and nothing happens. <laughs> and they actually don't know where the switches are. So they just sit in the dark. Well, and I'm like, okay, well, internet is down, probably it's something with the provider that will fix it, but hours pass and nothing changes. And then I get this wonderful email. Um, sorry for the trouble, apologies for any issues. Which issues? The internet is down? Which issues they apologize for? Any. So the internet is down, and they send an email, well, sorry about that, we fucked up, we rolled out an update, and then reset your entire system to the factory settings. And now we cannot do anything because your router is disconnected. We cannot send any fix. <laughs> so please do our work for us and reconfigure everything, basically. 
Now, the problem is this is email. You know what you need to get an email? <laughs> yeah. So I was away. I was on like, you know, other hotel Wi-Fi or whatever, and I got it. So I called her, and we reconfigured it. But, but that's the story. And, and now let's talk about patterns. And the continuous updates pattern is local rollback. So the problem is update went catastrophically wrong, and an over-update patch cannot reach the device. The only thing you can do, instead of sending me emails that so I will fix it, is actually have a previous version saved on the device prior to update. And then I can roll back if problem occurs. Right? And, and this is, you can say, okay, but this is an IoT device. That's like not my world. But I would claim that the idea of Internet of Things means everything. It means any device, including your server and your server in AWS, including any network, private or public or cloud, and everything else. So we are going to talk about patterns which are applicable for IoT, but also applicable for any type of computing that you do. And obviously, when we speak about IoT and any device, let's talk about updating cars. Again, what can possibly go wrong? <laughs> so one of the things that can go wrong is you didn't implement any way to update your cars. It might sound like a good idea, but it's actually it's not. So here is, this is fresh, this is June 7th this year. Um, Jaguar I-Pace had to do a massive recall because they have pro software problem with their brakes. Now, there are two problems with recall. First, it's goddamn expensive. Second, you cannot enforce a recall. You can send a letter in the red envelope, printed on red paper, and then people might come, but also may just ignore it. So that's a problem. Continuous update pattern, implement over the air software patterns. Physical recalls are costly, and obviously implement over the air software updates, preferably continuous updates. What are continuous updates, you will ask? Continuous updates are like normal updates, but better. Why they are better? Another example from automotive industry, the car that we all know and love for automatic updates is Tesla. Who has Tesla? Okay, couple of hands. Well, we're in Silicon Valley after all. Who knows what phantom braking is? Okay, couple, uh, yeah, maybe, thumbs up, you mean you like it? Okay, right, so, so you don't like it. Um, phantom braking is you drive an autopilot or assistant driving or whatever on, on a highway like 80 miles per hour, sorry, 65 miles per hour, um, nowhere recorded, and, and, and then out of the blue there are no cars, no pedestrians, no motorcycles, boom, it slams on brakes, and you go, <laughs> what happened? Not fun. Now, it obviously has to do with recognition, and it's like, you know, it was a shadow from a plane or, or whatever, a bridge, but it's really annoying. It's really annoying. And rumor has it that the latest update will fix it. Now, the problem is the updates are sporadical. Every two weeks, maybe, every month, every number of weeks. And, and you know what? What is your problem? Why you want to push the fix immediately? The answer is because they work on chess. It's very important, that's part of the new update that I still didn't get, by the way. Um, uh, well, when the car is charging, you need to spend your time somewhere, and, and one of the very important options is playing chess. So basically, this tiny thing Minor improvements and bug fixes fixes phantom braking, but I still didn't get it because they need to finish working on chess. <laughs> uh, so the difference between over there updates and continuous updates is that when you do batch updates, as Tesla does now, important features wait for non-important features Phantom breaking waits for chess. If you do continuous updates and whatever you have, you just push it, that problem obviously goes away. 
So now let's talk another aspect of this IoT connected world, and that's mobile. Mobile is fun by itself, and, and here it looks good, right? So both Google Play and um, what's it called, Apple App Store implemented continuous updates. Auto update is turned on. The second the, um, the authors of my new apps and games push an update, I get it, which is, which is great. And, and here is a story. Um, Nubs Adventure, I think it's noob for, for newbie, and this guy was a developer in his first game, so it's kind of going meta. It's an adventure game, and it's also an adventure for this guy who wrote it, and who d he documented all the experience. I took this example from his blog uh, May uh, 2015, a little bit while back, still very, very, very relevant. And one of, the, one of his experiences was, um, so he wanted to, to, do, to add a new feature that has something to do with monetizing the game. Um, so uh, he wrote some code that uses templating for a string replacement to do it in different languages and what's not. And the templating language that he uses uh, used the dollar symbol um, as a, um, as a token for, for replacement. And he tested it very thoroughly um, against Apple staging servers for monetization, for buying things. And uh, it goes like, tell me the price, this is the price, and he displays the price. And on the staging servers, Apple's, on the staging environment, Apple servers return prices without the dollar symbol. Some Apple production servers return the price with the dollar symbol. And when some of his users encounter those particular servers, the application, the game crashed because it obviously did the, the, token, the tokenization in the wrong place. Right, so some users suffer crashes and, and the problem is how can you debug it? You, ch you tested it. We spoke about how important testing is, but it doesn't solve our problem with trust. This is one example. He cannot do anything. He tested it with Apple infrastructure and it was just fine, but some of the users experienced crashes. And then it took, and, and, and then the worst, after he discovered what the problem is, you're like, okay, I'm going to do the rollback. I have the previous version. It's listed right there when we see all my releases, but there is no rollback functionality, not in the Apple App Store and not in Google Play. What you need to do is submit a new version, which might be identical to a previous one, but still you need to submit it. It will go through a review that will take what it takes, a couple of days, and only then you can update. There is expedited review. Still, they don't work on weekends because fuck it, it's weekend, we have better things to do. So, a lot of patterns here. First of all, our canary releases. Releasing the bug affects all the users, and you can release to a small number of users first and observe. If the problem occurs, stop the release, reverse the update for affected users, you obviously annoy much less people. Another one is observability. Regardless of you, even you, if you do a canary release or a full release, some problems are hard to trace relying on user feedback only, right? So people complain in, uh, in the reviews, one star, your, your uh, shitty game crashed on me. Thank you very much, that was useful. Now what? So instead, tracing, logging, monitoring, all the observability pillars need to be there. Obviously it works perfectly with the canary. You release to a small portion of your users and you observe, you look what's going on. The other patterns are rollbacks. Fixes might take time, users suffer in the meanwhile, instead of doing a new version, update rollback to a previous version, right? Implement rollback, the ability to deploy various versions without delay. Now, the problem is the platform is not supported. Uh, rollbacks are not supported on, the, on your deployment platform. Then you can implement, for example, a feature flag. And by that, embed two versions of features in the app itself and then trigger them using an API call. So for example, what he could do is actually um, 
hide this buy it or, or whatever purchase button uh, trigger programmatically um, if, if, you know, if, if things go wrong. So this is, this is great uh, and, and obviously that makes sense. And by now you should really be annoyed with me um, and some people even left and slapping the door, thank you. And, and, and you should be really annoyed with me because how many of you actually do IoT? No one, how about automotive? No one, how about mobile? No one, oh, a couple of guys, but, but yeah. But I mean, thank you for not leaving. Obviously, that's not about you. Well, it is about you. It is about you because those target platforms, the IoT, the automotive, and the mobile, are really much harder to work with than what you are doing all server-side uh, developers because you have much less things, they have much less things on their control. The availability of the target, you know when your servers are, are up, they have no idea when the last time the device was powered. The state of target, when you do deployment, you can always do clean slate. You can, uh, you know, drain the requests, restart the machine, wipe all, do whatever you like. They don't have the, the, that luxury. It might be that, you know, the, there is some state that's going on on the target device. And the version of the target, you know exactly from which version to which version you are updating, they have no idea. It might be that someone uh, installed this application or whatever five years ago and never touched it, and now they want to update to the latest version. Good luck with your database transition and what's not. Right, and, and, and the, the physical access to the target, you can SSH to your machine, you, and, and if you do on-prem, you can go to the server physically. They obviously don't have this luxury. They need to uh, to rely on sending me emails. We lost access to your target. So, I mean, if you don't do those patterns, you don't have any excuse. They do, you don't. But let's talk about your world. Let's talk about our world. Let's talk about server-side development, microservices, and all that. So. I'll start with one of the favorite failure stories in the industries, Knight Capital Group. Anyone heard about it? That's f seven years ago, 2012. Okay, one, one, one hand. So you are, all the rest of you are in for a treat because this is a great story. So Knight Capital Group, one of the biggest trading platform on uh, New York Stock Exchange, uh, 400 million in assets. Um, decided to roll out a new version of software, do a software update. Um, for some bizarre reason, the new system reused all APIs and flags on the backend. Don't do that, I don't know why they did that, but anyway, this is what happened. They used some old facilities of the old software. One out of eight servers was not updated for, for uh, you know, for the reason that we all know it wasn't automated enough and people make mistakes. And then new clients send requests to all eight of the machines, including the machine that wasn't updated. Since they reused the old APIs, new requests triggered some complete bizarre functionality. Selling instead of buying, I don't know what, but something like really screwed up. Now, what the engineers do when they see that they start bleeding money by the millions every minute? What do they do? Shut what down? Which servers? The new updated servers. Because something obviously went wrong with the update. Oh, there is one old server, let's keep it, it's fine. Let's shut down everything else. So now, instead of bleeding by tens of thousands, they're bleeding by the millions because all the transactions do the right thing. And they didn't have any monitoring, any alerting, any debugging, so I don't know, probably most of you sat on like, um, on call when your system is down, save one, and you're like really shaking because you know, you work on production system which is down and you try to bring it back online as, as fast as possible. 
Now, think about, okay, it's the same experience, but also your company loses money by the millions every minute. It took them 40 minutes to figure out what's going on. It cost them $440 million in losses. They went bankrupt this day, obviously. Um, so yeah, uh, update some patterns, automated deployment. This is kind of, the, that's the basics, right? People suck at repetitive tasks. Solution, don't trust people with those tasks. And if they had those updates, they would actually be, uh, be better. Frequent updates, they didn't update their software for a very long time and seldom deployments generate anxiety and stress leading to errors. Once you, when you update your production servers one in three years, no one in the company even remember the previous update. They're all quit by now. So three years. So um, obviously, you know, releasing, uh, updating frequently, you develop skill and habit and muscle memory in how to do it reduces the anxiety. State awareness. Target state can affect the update process and the behavior of the system after update. That's exactly what happened. The target machines had state and no one considered that. So you need to be known and considering the target state when you're updating and if you do revert, you might need to revert the state as well if previous state actually made sense. In this example, it was just that code, but it might also be that you change the state deliberately and you need to roll it back. Okay, um, so far so good. Um, next one, next one is also fun. Um, this is Matthew Price and he's the CEO of Cloudflare. And on June 24th this year, he released a very angry tweet uh, targeted on teams in Verizon that due to some misconfiguration actually affect the availability of Cloudflare. Which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's fair, uh, Verizon did fuck them up. Um, but the problem is that 10 days after, they went down by themselves now. And the only thing that wasn't in use, well, it's not Verizon for this time, huh, guys? So you bash them and then you, you know. So yeah, uh, that's more of a real time than software. Um, don't do that. I mean, we all made mistakes. And, and, you know, don't attack others and, you know, not your competitors, not your providers, just don't do that. But let's talk about their second outage, the, the, the Cloudflare. So new rules are routinely uh, deployed on Cloudflare for battling different types of attack, DDoS and other. There are actually a lot of companies that do that. They do continuous updates to fight uh, whatever, whatever crime they want to. So for example, t telecom do that as well. They update the algorithm of their smart cards um, every once in there so the carders you know, won't be able to use that anymore and, and, and others as well. And they, they release new, they update new, new rules very frequently. Um, and here they deployed a misconfigured rule. And th th this rule was just a bad regular expression in it and it spiked the CPU to 100%. Now, for me, this is a proof that if the Earth is going to die soon out of somewhere, something, it won't be like an eruption of Yellowstone or not even global warming, it will be someone else's bad regex that will kill us all. <laughs> um, and that, that's a proof. Now, the, the, the bizarre thing is that one rule with a wrong uh, regex that spikes a CPU on one machine actually brought down the entire Cloudflare. This is from their status page, affected region Earth. I love it. Now, how does it even happen? Because we would expect Cloudflare to know what kind of releases are. And we spoke about it, right? If you have a bug, don't hit the entire Earth with it. Release it to a small group of people. Now, the bizarre thing about it is that scanner releases is a concept that we learn when we are small. You remember your parents teach you how to do laundry and, st and remove stains? This is it. When you remove stains, 
you apply to a small part of fabric that is not easily seen to check that the stain is not fucked up now? I mean, literally when you're five, you know how to do kind of redeployment. <laughs> and, 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 and still here we are, right? So that's kind of redeployment would save Earth in this example. Okay, and, and I think that's the last one, and that's my favorite. MoviePass is shut down for several weeks to update their app. And that's like also, that's like, that's going on now. And I would say do zero downtime updates because you will probably lose all your users if you shut down for what, five weeks, still going on there, still down to perform an update. <laughs> Instead, do zero downtime, not five weeks, but zero. And then you do small and frequent updates that, that obviously makes it, makes it all good. So bringing everything home, no, no, they are updating. They are in the middle of update. Yeah. It looks like they're bankrupt, but they are just updating. <laughs> uh, to bring everything back home, continuous updates are frequent, automatic, tested, canary released, state aware, have observability, and extra credit, local rollback. I put it with an extra credit asterisk just because it is extremely hard to do if you are an IoT and you have zero control of your edge, you have to think about solar arrays installed in a desert and, and you know, there is no way to get there unless you're in a helicopter and it's a problem. So they need local rollbacks, you might not, but still, it's a, it's a good bundle. So with that, this is where we're gonna go. So update available, do we want it? No one asks us. Are there any high risk? If there are none, that's fine. But if they are, we can trust the updates. We can trust the updates because there are continuous updates and do everything that we spoke about to guarantee that this update won't fuck us up. And then we solve this impossible trade-off between features and, and, and trust. And uh, there is another name that we came for for, uh, for continuous updates. Um, Transition from bulk and rare software updates to extremely tiny and extremely frequent software updates. So tiny and so frequent that they provide an illusion of software flowing from development to the update target, and we call that liquid software. This is why we had the hashtag, and this is why we wrote a book. Liquid software, how to implement continuous updates. Um, I have a bunch of books there on uh, Jeff Rock Booth, uh, and um, if you're interested, come and grab one. I'll do a signing if you care for my signature in a horrible uh, handwriting. Um, and, and with that, mention for corner cases. We have to say that it's not always feasible or we always want continuous updates. When we, you know, a hospital in the middle of a surgery, software update of your uh, machines, um, Another example that I used to do, that I used to mention are, are planes. How about updating, uh, you know, software on a plane in, in mid-flight? Who thinks it's a bad idea? <laughs> okay, who thinks it's a good idea? My hand is up. You remember, exactly. You remember the story about security vulnerabilities? How about patching and vulnerability that is exploited during flight? That might be a good idea. That's, that's where our vision is. That's exactly that. And with that, uh, Twitter ads, because this is why I'm here. Um, as I mentioned, Jay Baruch, how many times I need to repeat? Go follow me now. <laughs> when you praise this talk, don't forget the DevOps world. And uh, that's uh, Liquid Software hash hash hashtag, obviously. LiquidSoftware.com. The blog is there and, uh, you know, PDF version of, of the book. And then jeffrock.com slash show notes is where everything is. With that, thank you very much. I think we're like seven minutes past the time, but I didn't, right? Is the next speaker even here or we can just go questions? We can do questions if you want to. Or if you don't have any questions here, I'm going to the booth now, so let's talk there. Thank you. <laughs>